مرغ باغ ملکوتم مرغ باغ ملکوتم نیم از عالم خاک دو سه روزی قفسی دو سه روزی قفسی ساخت اند از بدنم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أكرم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين I've been asked to repeat uh, very briefly verse 4 of this uh, ghazal from the Divan Shamsi Tabriz uh, one or two of the uh, participants didn't catch it obviously I was going much too fast بغير خدمة ما كمشارق الشاديست نديد خلق فني بناد زشادي آصاري. Apart from serving me, and that is the rising places of joy, people have never seen and never will see any sign of joy. Incidentally, something that we perhaps could have paused to reflect on is what does it mean to serve Allah? How could that analogy work? A king has servants because he needs their services, but the true king, subhanahu wa ta'ala, doesn't need anything at all. He is ghaniyun anil alameen. So when we say khidma, uh, we refer to that which we need in order to serve our own spiritual needs, uh, and the most fundamental need is to be in a state of affirming our slavehood to the one who is the source and the end of our being. This idea of khidmah is important in an institution like this, traditionally. You might see the second grandiose entrance to the uh, um, main building, which actually leads to the kitchens, because one of the first things that you did as an initiate or a novice here was to spend at least a year just serving in the kitchens. Uh, and on the other side of the building, there is underground the chile khanas. Some of you might have seen them. They've now been turned into the library, where you would go into a, a retreat to chile for an extended period, which was an essential part of uh, the discipline. And the purpose of it all is summed up in a piece of calligraphy that you might also have seen quite common in Turkey. I'm not sure if it's uh, to be found elsewhere. And the calligraphy just says, Hitch. Ha, ya. And then the Ottoman hat with three dots, hitch, which means nothing, which might seem a strange thing to want to elaborately design and hang on your wall. What it means is uh, that the way to the real is through making a nothing of yourself, so that you have no further turbulences, uh, egotistic aspirations, inward veils, uh, all of those come away so that you are nothing just point zero, and that is the beginning point of, of the way. Uh, and this is why so many of the uh, great ones, including the prophetic great ones, had uh, practices of seclusion. Uh, Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went into his uh, retreat for tahannuth in Ghari Hira, away from the mercantile hustle and bustle of the city of Mecca. Hazrat Abdul Qadir Jilani, Qadr Salahu Sirrahu, used to go to the ruins on the outskirts of Baghdad for his own times of reflection. Um, quite often we find that those forms of detachment from the world are coupled with practices of self-abasement Part of the program, insha'Allah, here will be to visit the Tekke on the Asian side of Istanbul of Aziz Mahmoud Hudayi, uh, one of the great beloved uh, awliya of the city of Istanbul. And he achieved what he achieved uh, because his own teacher, Hazrati Uftade, required him when Aziz Mahmoud Hudayi was the splendidly dressed mufti of the city of Bursa, a great scholar, 
to wear his scholar's robes, his robes as a qadi, uh, and to wander around the streets of Bursa selling tripe, offal, kidney. And this broke uh, Aziz Mahmoud Hodai's pride. It was very difficult for him, but such was his love for his sheikh that he obeyed and he became what he became. Um, the counselor, it said, to nine sultans. Uh, Shah Baha Adi Naqshband had a teacher called Amir Kulal and Amir Kulal really put Shah Baha Adin through the mill and made him work in this uh, degree of khidma for 21 years for 7 years serving animals for 7 years serving human beings for 7 years clearing up the streets and Shah Baha Adin mentions that the moment when the path was open to him was when he was bandaging up a, a, a crippled dog in the street, passers by not giving him a glance. And the dog rolled over on his back with his legs in the air and started to howl. And at that moment, Shah Baha Adin Naqshband realized the submission, the absolute submission of everything to the Lord of existence. And at the end of the dog's howl, he said, Amin. And he also mentions that during this period of service to the animals, he encountered a chameleon. And he saw how the chameleon changed its color depending on the background around it. Complete submission to the moment with no possibility of an egotistic interruption of anything, just a complete belongingness to what is and he experienced his, uh, his, his opening to the divine in that state. And that was his particular way through service to the animals. But this principle of service is axiomatic and something that, since most of the time, we inhabit a culture that merely facilitates our desire to serve ourselves, something that we need to be reminded of. So let's pick up where we were um, yesterday. Uh, We've reached line number seven. Zabari ashq talab kon aqidah shirin kitaba sirke furush ast behure afshari. From the garden of love, seek the doctrine that is sweet, aqidah shirin. Human nature is a seller of vinegar and a crusher of sour grapes. Characteristic opposition, but this does need a certain amount of unpacking. But here he's introducing one of his favorite themes, which is that of the garden. Gardens are really important in Islamic civilization, of course, because the garden is uh, the paradisal abode. It is the place where the final differentiation of, of the divine rigor and the divine beauty takes place. The Yom al Fossil and everything is separated and the fire is the manifestation of the divine Jalal and the garden, the manifestation of the divine Jamal uh, prevailed over by the principle of the divine Rahma and uh, everything there is in a state of balance and appropriateness Salam and Salama so the Muslim soul craves that and this is an example of how universal these images are because there's nobody, I think, who doesn't like gardens. Uh, a garden reminds us of our paradisal origin, reminds us of the paradisal return to which we are summoned, and reminds us, therefore, that the logical response to being between two gardens is to try and inhabit a garden-like reality in this world not the fire of cupidity and desire and aspiration, but the garden of sincerity where everything is salam and salama. So gardens are important in this tradition, and of course there's gardens here, and roses tend to uh, populate these gardens, but sometimes 
Uh, other flowers as well in the Ottoman tradition in particular, the tulip is very popular. You'll see sometimes it's the symbol of Istanbul. You see tulip uh, ceramics and um, fabrics uh, all over the place. And the tulip is uh, often regarded as the symbol of the wine glass. And the wine glass uh, represents the lover of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is full of the intoxicating love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet and hence is in the state of istiqama, uprightness. It's a love that makes us straight and, and balanced. And the poets go on to explain how the tulips together are like the dervishes in a teke such as this, all together intoxicated um, and remembering their Lord. So, um, the tulips um, in the jami, uh, in the gathering of of uh, of Fellowship, Bismi uh, Eshret, are showing the wine glasses of um, contentment. Uh, this is very standard in the Ottoman literature. That a place like this is a kind of garden, even though it's indoors. The reality of it is that it's an anticipation of what the people of paradise do, which is to remember their Lord. So the dervishes are like the flowers in the rose garden, and the uh, images go on. But roses are more common generally than tulips, although there's a whole language of crocuses and other plants that you get, and it gets quite uh, elaborate. Um, gardens are also important because they are often hidden places, particularly in hot countries where you need to keep them from the elements. You can pass by somebody's garden and not know that it's there. It might be up behind a wall. It's a hortus conclusus, uh, protected, hidden, secret garden. Gulshani Raz, the secret rose garden, is the title of a number of books in our civilization, most notably the work of Mahmoud Shabistari. Why does the garden need to be protected? And the word Jannah has its origins in the Arabic root that means to hide, to be secret. The word Jinn comes from the same root. Uh, it is because... Uh, from the uninitiated, the mazahir, the forms of the divine beauty, have to be protected. The Kaaba is appropriately veiled with the kiswa. The face of female beauty is appropriately veiled with a veil. Strong manifestations of the divine jamal in the world are not just to be um, paraded in the sulk, but are to be protected and the garden as the ultimate place where the divine rahma is, is, is manifest obviously has to um, tropologically be in the same veiled state. So for instance here's something from Rumi's Fihi Ma Fihi where he talks about uh, events, states that might uh, supervene in the life of the one who is traveling to Allah that seems supernatural or amazing Khawarik Lil Ada and he gives the usual counsel which is that you kind of suppress talk of these things. Remember the story that um, we had of the uh, of the Mevlevi Chelebi yesterday who saw the, this extraordinary karama in Medina and told people not to tell anybody. Um, uh, Rumi says this, I counsel my murids that when brides of meaning show their faces to you within yourselves and when the mysteries are unveiled to you, be careful. Be careful lest you, lest, lest you speak of them to others. Do not describe them and do not tell the words that you hear from me to everyone. Imagine that should you gain a beloved and she conceals herself within your house saying, display me to nobody for I belong to you. Would it ever be fitting and lawful to take her around the bazaars and say to everyone, come and look at this beautiful woman. That beloved would never be pleased for that to happen to her and indeed she would be angry with you. So that's another part of the imagery of gardens. They're kind of secret places and Rumi is playing with this and it's uh, one reason for this veiling of the secrets that can happen in, in a true sincere uh, religiously upright gathering of, of vicar is to protect that person from becoming a kind of spectacle, some sort of wizard in the eyes of the uh, uninitiated. Um, there's the story of a, a, a dervish in Istanbul who had a sheikh who was extraordinary and was constantly manifesting the signs of Allah's favor to him. But they lived in this tumble-down old wooden teke, and in his whole tariqah there was just a sheikh and this one dervish. And the dervish was upset and thought, my sheikh 
He's so great. It's shameful that he doesn't have a thousand murids who can see his greatness. The sheikh just wanted to concentrate on the murid and didn't want his teke to be full of people. Uh, but the murid insisted and insisted and insisted and said, oh sheikh, it would be so much so beneficial to everybody if this building is full of people and they can see your karamat and see your beautiful isharat. And eventually the sheikh relented in order to teach the murid a lesson. So uh, he, I'll cut the story short, he showed in public part of the majesty of his state by a public uh, karama, which everybody saw. And that night, there was about a thousand people trying to get into this teke because they'd heard of the, the miracle of, of the sheikh and they wanted to see some other kind of conjuring trick. They were fascinated. And the murid was very happy because he thought the sheikh was getting the attention that he deserved. Uh, but as the days went by, he realized he was getting less quality time with his teacher. He was kind of sitting further and further away from the sheikh until he was with the sandals and the passers-by outside, sitting on the street with people who'd come late. And eventually he realized that actually things had been better before. And the sheikh at that moment looked at him and realized that the murid had learned his lesson. And he gave him a strange instruction. He said, bring to me um, a, a sheep's bladder filled with air. And so the murid did that. And the sheikh uh, placed it under his arm, under his jubba, and said to everybody, it's time to pray, let's all go to the mosque and pray. They marched off to the mosque, and the sheikh was about to lead all of these thousand new, new murids in the namaz. And just before he said the takbir, he squeezed the bladder so it sounded as if he'd broken his wudu very loudly in this mosque. And he continued to pray. And everybody said, A'uzu billah, this is a sheikh of shaitan. And they ran out. <laughs> and that night, in the little old wooden teke, it was just the old sheikh and the one murid and doing their beautiful dhikr together. And the murid had learned his lesson. So Allah protects his people by all kinds of um, means. So the garden, a place of protection in this literature. Um, it's also the place of recollection of the place where the memory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just memory but is an actual presence and we breathe this in gardens and Allah has set signs, he's not set signs in creation, everything in creation is signs and the garden awakes within us a breath of um, our place of return. So the famous uh, Turks here will uh, know this one from their childhood. Shol jannatin urmaklaru akher Allah deyo deyo Shol jannatin urmaklaru akher Allah deyo deyo Chukmish Islam bilbilleri it's just the first verse, but it goes on. It's one of uh, the poems attributed to Yunus Emre, the first great uh, poet of the Teke tradition. And it means, well, I shall read the whole thing in an English translation. The silver streams of paradise, they flow and sing, Allah, Allah. The nightingales of faith arise and sing aloud, Allah, Allah. With faces brighter than the moon, with voices sweet, they all commune. The heavenly maiden sing this tune, Subhanallah, Allah, Allah. There's eating and there's drinking there, with angel mercies everywhere. Idris, his prophet's robes shall wear, and all shall sing, Allah, Allah. The angels of Allah all raise their voices with his endless praise. Tasbih and hamd and shukr always, so sing with them, Allah, Allah. Yunus Emre has this to say, we'll meet together on that day where songbirds sing and fountains play, so sing with me, Allah, Allah. It's about the most well-known religious poem in the whole Turkish language. So the garden is also a place of, of dhikr, of remembrance. Um, it's also a place of perfume. And one of the things that these poets like to do with flowers is 
perfume and scent is a very profound spiritual uh, sense and it's in the hadith isn't it one of the three things that were made beloved to the holy prophets Allah was sent it, it, it awakens um, spiritual yearning and aspiration in us the scent of a flower the scent of incense <coughs> Rumi says, you were like uh, an intoxicated night nightingale surrounded by owls. And then the scent of the rose garden came and you flew off to the rose garden. Bulbul or the nightingale, an image of the one who sings out of delight for the fragrance of the rose in this sort of kind of language. The nightingale comes to the garden because it's drawn by the uh, scent of the rose and sings to the rose. And sometimes the one who is the praiser of the Holy Prophet وسلم, compares himself to the nightingale who comes to sing to the, the beauty of the rose. So this again is, is extremely common. The, the garden is perfumed and people are drawn to it. The dhikr has a, a perfume. Um, and the final image, well there's lots more, but the final common image uh, for the garden in this literature is, is the heart. The heart of the one who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is compared to a garden because it's full of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, this is from the hadith. If you pass the gardens of paradise, graze. قَالُوا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهُ وَمَا رِيَادُ الْجَنَّةِ And they said, O Messenger of Allah, and what are the gardens of paradise? قَالْ حِلَقَ الذِّكْرِ The circles of remembrance, exactly like this one here. So all of these images, you find they do tend to have roots going right back in the uh, original prophetic wisdom. So that's the imagery of the garden, which is uh, important. But uh, he goes on to this, say this strange thing, from the garden of love seek the sweet doctrine. Um, is saying that the true belief about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only possible in connection with the heart that is filled with love for Allah. A heart that is full of desire, passion, envy, uh, rancor will not produce true, true doctrine. Uh, and this is in our vocabulary in that we speak of heresy in terms of hawa desire, willfulness. True doctrine is something that's sweet and natural. It's from the fitra. Uh, it's what is, in a sense, intuitive and obvious. Uh, and error, belief in some infallible imam or in reincarnation or in some strange thing, comes usually from well, the, the souls of the ahl al-ahwa, the people of desires, turbulence. So doctrine itself is connected to spiritual growth. If there is a heart full of fire, it will produce a doctrine that is corrupt and will bring fire and uh, misery to the world. If there is a heart full of love, then, of course, guided by the data of revelation and the consensus of the scholars, if there is a, a, a heart that is like a garden, then it will uh, produce a naturally inclined to a sweet doctrine. Verse number eight. Come to the side of the hospital of your maker, of your own creator. For whoever does not have that physician can only find medicines that will make him sick. Again, a common image that... Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who are calling to him are like doctors, physicians. And a place where that takes place is like Dar shifa like a hospital. So very often, again, in this literature, the gathering place of the dervishes is compared to uh, a hospital, Bimaristan or Dar shifa uh, That's fairly obvious. Uh, and of course, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the imam of these physicians. So in a famous line where Rumi actually switches into Arabic, he says, Hada Habibi, Hada Adibi, Hada Tabibi, Hada Shifai. This is my teacher, this is my beloved, this is my physician, this is my cure. 
speaking of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, and again, often in our literature, we find the sort of pun with Habib and Tabib, uh, very common. Um, the question here arises as to where these sicknesses come from, if the world is Allah's world, and uh, we were born in the state of fitra, and there are these physicians to help us, why should we be sick? Why is this place like a hospital where we're all trying to sort ourselves out by the recollection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, here Rumi often reflects on the nature of unbelief, whether it be complete formal kufr or that unbelief that veils our heart, that prevents us from seeing the divine agency in everything in our lives, the little kufr, the little covering up. And he builds on the idea that uh, the kafir is just his own enemy. You should feel sorry for him because of his blindness. Uh, and he doesn't harm Allah. He doesn't harm the reality of Allah's world. He is just harming himself. And he's allowed the sickness, which is not from his nature, but from his uh, denial of his nature uh, to damage himself. He has caused his own sickness, or his nafs has caused his own sickness. So in the Masnavi, we get this um, sequence. The unbelievers are their own enemies. By denying, they keep on wounding themselves. An enemy is a man who tries to take your life, not one who takes his own. The pitiful veiled bat is its own enemy, not the sun's. The sun's shining will kill it, but how can it annoy the sun? An enemy is one who inflicts torment, who bars the ruby from glowing with light, but the unbelievers all bar themselves from the radiance of the Prophet's gem. How can people veil the eyes of those unique men? No, they make their own eyes blind and perverse, like an angry Hindu servant who kills himself to spite his master, throwing himself down from the roof of the house to inflict on him an inconvenience. If the patient becomes the physician's enemy, if the child becomes hostile to its teacher, in reality, they block their own roads. They themselves have wasted their own lives and minds. If a washerman becomes angry with the sun, if a fish becomes angry with the ocean, look and see who loses, in the end, who will suffer misfortune. This is important for Rumi because his way of love uh, means that uh, the correct way of viewing those who are veiled from that path should be the way of compassion and pity rather than primarily the way of anger. Those people are not harming reality, they're not harming Allah, they're just harming themselves. They've cut themselves off from the ocean of the divine beneficence, so we should feel sorry for them. And this uh, is the predominant mode of the prophetic view of his own people. Allah mahdi qawmi fa'inhum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, guide my people because they do not know. And again, this is the consequence of the heart that is filled with the dhikr, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he uh, feels sorry for the sinners and the miscreants and the disbelievers rather than immediately uh, feeling enraged by them. Uh, sometimes, of course, the medicine in these hospitals is bitter. The consequence of this process is aqidi shirin, the sweet, beautiful doctrine. But sometimes we have to take the hard medicine, like Shahab Shabaha ad din for seven years serving animals in the street, Aziz Mahmoud Hudai in his uh, Qadi's turban, selling offal in the streets of Bursa. Sometimes the medicine is bitter, and um, any physician will tell you that some forms of treatment are uh, painful. So Rumi says, if you have newly become a lover, take the bitter medicine and drink it, so that Shirin may make you sweeter than Khusrau's honey. This is the image of Khusrau and Shirin, the uh, legendary Persian uh, lovers. Uh, so again, an image that he uses again and again is of uh, overcoming the lower soul and experiencing with equanimity the blows of fate uh, is the way to 
experience this inner state of sweetness rather than endlessly being in a condition of protest. Verse number nine, Jehan mesali tenne bisar ast bi an shah, bepech girdi chunan sar mesali destari. Another complicated image. The world is like a body with no head without that king. Around such a head, wrap yourself around like a cloth, a sarak, turban cloth. Now, in Rumi, the body or tan is equivalent to the khak, which is the soil, it's the clay of our nature. And here he's saying the whole world without the recollection of the reality of the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a body without a head. That is what the unbeliever sees. He sees a principle without a directing principle. He sees senses and limbs and activity without there being any centralized consciousness or intelligence, intelligence or unifying principle behind it. So without recollection, what can you understand of the world? Now, his attitude to body is complex because, of course, this is an Islamic system. So, uh, on the one hand, the body is kind of, it's not really what we are. It's the context for what we are. Uh, and there's something in it that holds us back. It's the body, not the spirit, that is subject to gravity which is what keeps us rooted to dunya, and the body is the place of our passions, our desires, our legitimate needs, our illegitimate needs. So he says, uh, You are a royal falcon held in the clutches of an old woman. But when you hear the falconer's drum, you fly up to the place which is no place. So here he's comparing the spirit within the body to the royal falcon. Bazichas is one of his favorite images. Uh, the falcon belongs to the king, and the falcon can fly. And the falcon also can catch other birds and bring them to the king, which is what the prophets do, which is what the awliya do. They see other creatures and they bring them back to the king. The process may be painful, but the point is to be brought back to uh, the king. But it's in the clutch, this royal falcon within us that needs to fly and needs to help others is in the clutches of oh, and the old woman, Pirizan. Uh, from a distance, she looks really attractive. You want to get to know her, and then you kind of lift the niqab, and it's not quite what you would wish. That's dunya. Dunya is always kind of glittering, and, but when we really get into it, if you really get into some pleasure or to some vice or some addiction, you see the, the, the sickness that's there. So we're in the clutches of that. The royal falcon has been trapped into the clutches of that false beauty. Uh, but we need the falconer's drum and we fly up to the place which is no place. Um, sometimes also he uses the image of the, 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 the tohum, the egg. Within the egg of the body, you are a marvelous bird, but since you are inside the egg, you cannot fly. So all of this sounds like the body is a kind of hapishane, like a, a, a prison. But it's not a dualist system. Islam is not against the body. It's merely against the body which is ensnared helplessly because it hasn't educated itself. So Rumi also says this, this is from the Masnavi. O oh, you who has drawn nourishment from the heavens and the earth until your body has grown fat and round. Hold fast to the spirit. These other things are false. I call them false in relation to the spirit, not in relation to the masterly work of their creator. So he's saying you're kind of obese like most of us are nowadays. We eat too much. There's too much dunya within us. But he's saying these things are also the masterly work of their creator. creator the pile of kufter, the whatever it might be. Also Allah's gift is, don't despise that, um, but don't overdo it. Balance is the right way. And then the body can become this thing that adds to the beauty 
of the human and as to the beauty of the prayer. Part of the beauty of the prayer is its bodily form. Verse number 10. Eger siyah ne ayine medeh az dast, keroh ayine tu ast, jisn zengari. Switches images again. If, you are, if your face is polluted, do not let the mirror leave your hand. For the soul is your mirror, the body is its rust. So he's still talking about the body and soul, but he's using another image. The soul is your mirror, the body is its rust. And he has a long famous story in the Masnavi about Satan Yusuf being given a mirror, which is one of the most beautiful things in, uh, in the Masnavi, which I, I suspect we don't have uh, time for here. <coughs> but uh, the basic principle is that the ayine, the mirror, it sounds simple. We are naturally of Allah. We are f- royal falcons. We affirmed the bala, written up there if you've worked your way through this ghazal that's what we are we've all said bala shahidna yes we bear witness that's the deepest level of our consciousness and what we are um, <clears throat> and we are called to our natural abode wallahu yad'ukum ila daris salam he's calling us to paradise he's not calling us to hell that's where we belong that's our natural context where we will say <coughs> salam and salama gaze into Allah upon the face of our creator that's what we're made for that's our natural state and if you're looking at the contentions book you'll see number one is an attack on a certain type of western christian sense that the image of god is actually perverted within us that we need redeeming from what we actually are (coughs) that the garden is not our natural state but in islam no original sin the garden is our home that's where we belong our home is the divine glory so it should be simple. So if you look at humanity, why is it that we mess up so badly? It's because although we all, even unbelievers, recognize the need to overcome the lower self to some degree, otherwise we just binge out on chocolates or whatever it might be and we see very quickly that dunya in an unrestrained way does make us sick. <coughs> Still, we don't really know how to do that in a systematic way. The secularist overcomes the self in order to gratify the self at some future point. Studies hard so he can become a big shot physician and make more money and have a car, whatever it might be. The believer is different because the believer is kind of relaxed. Whether or not all of this works out for him in dunya is up to Allah. He has that deep stillness. What counts is the jannah. The jannah ultimately is not about what he's going to do for it. It's about Allah's generosity. So the one who is talib dunya is always in a state of anxiety because he's jostling with others for what's finite. But the talib al-akhirah is in a state of serenity because he knows ultimately everything is in Allah's decree and the divine rahmah will prevail. But he still works, of course, out of adab for his Lord and to the extent that he loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those works will come naturally but still how do we overcome these low lower tendencies we need to see ourselves to overcome the self is problematic because the self is what we are how can i see or study or understand my own self anything else is relatively easy to conceptualize how i can deal with it but the self and philosophy of mind nowadays is one of the most difficult aspects of philosophy issues such as artificial intelligence what is the self what are we in our innermost core difficult we don't understand ourselves <coughs> so the way to do it is for somebody to hold up a mirror <coughs> just as we can't really work out what we look like until we uh, see a mirror a reflection the soul is the same but what could be the mirror of the soul well the soul is a mirror that works in two ways first of all it's the mirror that can reflect the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and needs to be polished and the body's passions are the rust over it. Zingari, which is what he's saying in this qasida. But we also need somebody else's mirror held up to us. And it has to be a good mirror, polished and beautiful, so that we can see ourselves correctly. So if somebody whose heart has been polished, and there's hadith that indicate that the polish of the heart is dhikrullah, 
that person who's close to us will be transformed because we'll start to learn at a very deep level intuitive things about ourselves. If we see a perfected human being, we will realize what a bad state we're in. If we're always hanging out, partying with useless friends, we'll never be in that state. And that's what the herd instinct of the nafs always craves. But the presence of the real sage uh, holding up to us an image of Adamically what we can become can have an electrifying effect. So this is what uh, is saying here. We need the sage with the mirror. Verse number 11. Kojast tajiri mes'odi mushteri ta'le'aki garandari manish basham ukhari dari. Where is the fortunate or felicitous merchant for whom Jupiter is in the ascendant, from whom I can buy his wares and become warm-hearted? So now he's switching images again, but those who really are profoundly immersed in these Ghazals see the connections. Rumi is operating not on the basis of some linear conceptualized story of what the self is, what God is, what the world is, because language doesn't really do justice to that, but at a deeper level. Again, this is where the image of music can be helpful. Why exactly does uh, Beethoven switch from the second development in the first movement of his ninth symphony to another theme and change to uh, B-flat major difficult to put into words, although the musicologists can kind of write it out and even write a PhD thesis on that moment, but it doesn't do justice to the effect that it has on the soul of the listener. Similarly, with this great literature, it's hard to know exactly where Rumi's soul swimming in the sea of love is taking us next, but we know that it's the right direction because each of these things gently presses a button and kind of unlocks us. It's a little bit like opening a combination lock. That, uh, and the Qur'an is often like this, but at an infinitely deeper level. That's one reason why Rumi is sometimes compared to... You know, it, it's the Qur'an in the Persian language. It doesn't mean it's claiming to be revelation, but it moves thematically in a way that responds to the deeper logic of the human heart, not to the mind, because it's about for ulul al-bab, for the people of understanding. So you, if you're opening a combination lock, you're robbing a bank and you go right to 55, and then left to 12, and right to 45, well, the sequence of the numbers is not really something you want to think about in great detail. Uh, but what counts is that after doing that, eventually, if you get it right, the door opens. And sacred literature is at its, at its deepest level. And if you listen to traditional rabbis, they say that they find this in the Hebrew Psalms as well. The deepest level opens the door of the heart through combinations that... <coughs> On the, on the surface, uh, hard really to, to ponder and to understand. The scholars have talked about the nazm in the Qur'an, and nowadays, because we like to turn the Qur'an into some kind of textbook or manifesto, we're really determined to see the Qur'an as a linear text, and it's not. It operates at a much more profound level. But because we've lost the aesthetic dimension of religion so much and the deeper level of religion, we are puzzled by the form of the Qur'an. But the real believer drinks the Qur'an in with his heart during tarawih and is transformed. And the text is there um, to transform you. It's hudan lil muttaqeen, guidance for people with taqwa, which is an inner heart state. It's not a mental state. So, Rumi is here, changing direction again. Where is the felicitous merchant? Well, he has indicated this metaphor of trading earlier on in the Ghazal, hasn't he? For whom Jupiter is in the ascendant. Um, and this is a, a system in which the stars and the spheres are integrated, um, not in an astrological sense, because that's uh, haram, but because they are metaphors of certain possibilities uh, in creation. It's also possible, since he's using a commercial Im- image, the imagery here, that it doesn't actually mean mushtari, the, the planet, but just the purchaser. The purchaser is in the ascendant, which would mean that he's saying something like the customer is always right. But in this system, Jupiter is identified with uh, the intellect. Saturn, Zohal, is the ego, the nafs. Uh, and Jupiter is auspicious. Uh, it's identified with gold, um, 
with the imperishable. Um, so let's try and work out this complicated image. Where is the felicitous merchant for whom Jupiter is in the ascendant, from whom I can buy his wares and become warm-hearted? Well, uh, garam or warm in Persian has uh, almost in the English mm -hmm. sense, uh, it, the sense of uh, affection. So garam dilan means ardent lovers, uh, hot-hearted lovers. But also it has the sense of something that's intense. Uh, garam raftar, literally somebody who's traveling warmly, but it means a fast traveler. But it can also mean... Um, that these are goods which are selling like hot cakes, for instance, commerce is very hot today, um, it, the market is warming up. Um, and that, that seems to be what he's saying here, that this is a, a hot marketplace and that I'll be successful in this uh, transaction um, in buying the wares of the merchant who is selling this, uh, this extraordinary treasure, this gold-like knowledge. Let me speed up. I would like to finish this today. Verse number 12. Bayave fikrati man kon ke fikrati daram chu la al mi khari az kani man bi Come and think about me, fikrati man kon. Come and give thought to me who gave you your thought. Buy a whole donkey load of rubies from my mine. Uh, and again, I think the image here is, is fairly straightforward. Just think, use your fikr in the sense of deeper, intuitive thought uh, and be assisted in that by the awareness of the mystery of the existence of consciousness at all. That's the beginning of religious quest in a certain way, the mystery of the self. What is it that perceives this unique Adamic thing? Uh, a lecture was given in Cambridge recently by a French uh, cosmologist, He's an expert in galaxy formation, and he was asked by a student, what's the strangest thing in the universe? And he thought for a while, and then he replied, the fact that it can be understood. You know, whole galaxies of uh, X-ray stars, amazing stuff that's out there. The strangest thing is the fact that we can look at them, understand them, assess them, that the mathematics works, that there is ratio, that there is logos, that there is reason that can discursively apprehend these things, chemical and physical constants that can be mapped and understood, even stranger than the existence of those constants in creation. Uh, he was uh, very interesting on that. And science can't go there. That's to do with the asrari khudi, the secrets of the self that's beyond the possibility of, of a scientific apprehension. So with your thought, uh, give thought to the one who created thought, who gave you your thought, is what Rumi is encouraging us to do. By a whole load, donkey load of rubies from my mind, um, lal here means uh, that which is uh, precious in the world insofar as it is a pure recollection of the divine. Everything is, properly speaking, but there are some which are more perfect or more, more perfectly accessible manifestations of the divine reality than others. To the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is kal yaquti bayn al-hajari. He's like a ruby amongst stones. All the stones are like the hasa, they're all making tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there's some which are more perfect manifestations, more translucent than others. Why? not because some are more created by Allah than others, because Allah is the only one whose being sustains them all, but because the manifestation of the divine predicates in those entities is uh, more full. The totality of the divine names is reflected in, manifested in the Holy Prophet wasallam, which is why he is uh, Allah's perfect Khalifa on this earth. And this is the meaning of the hadith, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ Adorn yourself with the qualities of Allah. He is Rahman, you should be merciful. He is Adl, you should be just. He is Halim, you should be mild, and so on. And that's what it is to be 
again, Rumi's image, Allam al Asma' Beg, man is the one um, who is taught uh, the names. Bayar Bejani be ankas bedo ke payat dad, bedo negar bedo di di kedad di dari. Come, come forward to the one who gave you your feet. So it's the same kind of image. Use your feet to approach the one who gave you your feet. Approach him with what you are, because he is the one who gave you what you are. Look with your two eyes, your two eyes, on the one who gave you sight. Verse 14. Do kaf bishadi ye o zan, o zan, ke kaf az bahre vayast, ke nis chadi ye ora ammi utimari. Clap both of your hands out of delight in him. Your hand is from his sea. There is neither grief nor misfortune when compared to his delight. So again, the image of the shadi and this idea of dhikr yielding the true joy, which is the natural vocation of man, is, is the most common and most fundamental principle of the divan, Shamsi Tabriz. This is where Rumi is burnt, burnt by the fire of this uh, love, Artishi Ashk, it's completely roasted him. So he's producing this ecstatic, ecstatic and extraordinary verse. So clap both of your hands out of delight in him. Even your hand is from his sea. When you clap your hands, it's, it's all from him, from that ocean. And the ocean is an important image, and we should think about this. What is the Darya, the Bahar? It is life, love, spirit. That's what the sea signifies in our literature. Now I think we have just one more to do. So I'm going to sing a Turkish ilahi which is um, entitled This Love is a Sea Without Shore Wa Ashk Bir Bahri Ommandur and it does have a chorus so please help me out by joining in. This is in the maqam called Nihavend. O Ashkbir Bahre O Mandur O Ashkbir Bahre O Mandur Bona Hadi Kenar Olmas Bona Hadi Kenar Olmas Salatullah Salamullah Salatullah Salamullah Alayka Ya Rasulullah Alayka Ya Habiballah Dalilim Surakul Amdur Dalilim Surakul Amdur Bono bilende aal olmaz Bono bilende aal olmaz Salatullah selamullah Salatullah selamullah Aleyke ya Resulallah Aleyke ya Habibullah Seyfullah sözünde mehestir Seyfullah sözünde mehestir Şeyhinden aldı destir Şeyhinden aldı destir Salat Allah, selam Allah Salat Allah, selam Allah Aleyke ya Resulullah Aleyke ya Habiballah Divane ra kalem nistir, divane ra kalem nistir. Ne söyle sekinan olmaz, ne söyle sekinan olmaz. Salat Allah, selam Allah. 
Salatullah, Salamullah, Aleka ya Rasulullah, Aleka ya Habibullah. Yep, so this is um, Sayyid Saifullah, one of the famous uh, Ilahi. This uh, love is a sea uh, without limits, an endless sea, uh, which has neither boundary nor shore. And again, this is an image that the poets love. How can the Sheikh tell me to enter the sea when he's saying that the sea has no shore, it has no boundary? And the answer is, of course, we were always in the sea. We are all partaking in the world which is nothing other than a combination of divine names. There's nothing else here except the pure, unmediated, unqualified, undefiled interaction of the asma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing else. This is, everything is signs. And to the extent that we see things as signs, we are partaking in the Adamic reality. We are returning to the garden where everything was recollection and our natural destination is the garden where everything will be recollection. To the extent that we don't see things as signs but we see them as, in some sense, independent, self-subsistent, that's where the fiery possibility starts and we become like Iblis who didn't see that recollection, that perfection within Adam and the possibility of the infernal begins, that fundamental error. So, the, but the reality, according to these poets, and the Mevlevi sheikhs in particular were aware of this, is that we're all already in that ocean. We just have to open our eyes to see that that's where we are. And the last line, number 15. Tu bi do tu. Kenist gufti zaban bi khilafu azari. You must listen with both ears and speak to him without a tongue. For the tongue's words are never without disagreement or harm. Rumi makes a lot of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us two um, of many of the instruments of our senses and of course the Qur'an itself reminds us of this. أَلَمْ نَجْعَلْ لَهُ عَيْنَيْنِ وَلِسَانًا وَشَفَتَيْنِ Have we not given him two eyes and a tongue and two lips? And the Dajjal has one eye. And again, you'll find some um, musings on this in the little contentious book, contentions book. Because the quality of the one who is a pretender is that he sees without perspective. The biological advantage of having two eyes is that it gives us the ability to judge distances because of the kind of um, parallax that the eyes can generate. When you have only one eye, it's much harder to judge distances. And this is uh, a ni'mah that we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. But the poets want to make this into a symbol that the real believer sees with both eyes, hears with both ears, and so on. And what does that mean? One tongue, please, not a forked tongue. The munafiq has the forked tongue. And the beginning of Al-Baqarah tells us about those people. A believer has one tongue, yekzaban, but two eyes and two ears uh, because we need a perspective, but the perspective in the reality of what we are in our Bartin is to see outward and inward. To see what things are in the his and also in their ma'na. On the surface of things in the world, we see, well, the signs, signposts. The world is just a mass of signposts, which would be really confusing, but alhamdulillah, they're all pointing to a single destination, so it's not confusing at all. <coughs> uh, the one who is like the Dajjal, and Rumi has another poem, again it's in the Contentions book, 
where he talks about us we, we must not be like Iblis who is also A'war the one-eyed because he saw only <coughs> the clay the outward form of Adam and said well that's not my Qibla that's not what I'm going to bow down to um, but what he didn't see is that clay in itself is something that is from the earth which is from humility that when we are on that level of ground level without the intellect building castles in the air we are at that degree of hitch, nothing and the ruh prevails properly over the spirit but Iblis didn't spot that and the Dajjal will not spot that so that's the error that happens with a one-eyed catastrophe at the beginning of the human story and at the end of the human story in dunya, at the end of history, the Dajjal has the same error, sees with one, one eye. And the quality of the end times is that there will be an unbalanced focus on Zahir or on Batin. For unbelievers, of course, um, there is only Zahir. But for the great majority of human beings who are still believers, uh, the problem of the age is uh, a focus on the surface of things and an inability to go deeper into what is aesthetic, beautiful, merciful, wise, balanced. So a quality of the age of the Dajjal is exoterism, focusing only on the surface. But also uh, a potential Dajjalic uh, interruption is an excessive esoterism. All of these people on grail quests and looking for the ultimate secret of Ibn Arabi's 21st you know, heaven and endlessly going into the most esoteric stuff without getting the basics right. And that's also a fundamental error of our age because the nafs loves all kinds of exotic Baroque spiritual stories without um, taming itself first and uh, the tradition that was practiced in this place for instance was that you start off not by reading about the unity of being of course not you start off in the kitchen for a year and then you make your dhikr in your chille khane and you're in the degree of service even Shah Baha Adin Naqshband who was a great scholar before he started needed 21 years before he was cooked um, but we want to kind of find a shortcut. Everything is shortcuts nowadays. Even on computers, there's always a shortcut. There's always a cheat on the computer game. There's always some way of getting around the hard work. And we want the same thing because there seems to be so little time or at least so little barakah in our time. But there isn't really a shortcut unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the gate into paradise for you and you go very fast. But we can't rely on that happening. It's not so common. Mostly it's Sayyidul Suluk, Brevandagan, constantly trudging forwards, carrying the burden until it becomes something sweet and light, but that takes, takes time. So the esoterist deviation is common in our age as well. People looking for interesting, exotic, colorful descriptions of what it's like to be a saint without sorting out you know, their own knowledge of how to make wudu properly. And that's a condition of end time deviation. But the one who is truly in balance is the one who hears with both ears. He hears the words and hears what is meant by the words. And sometimes you hear the sheikhs, this is interesting, and I might talk about this later on, the sheikhs saying that the quality of, of, of women is less prone to subversion than the quality of men under those conditions uh, because of a certain uh, ability to look for meaning rather than just form. Famously, women listen not just to what the man is saying, his description of something, but why he's saying it, what he means by that, what he thinks of me, what his intentions are. And they have a greater kind of intuitive wisdom, which is a spiritual wisdom, and is one reason why women were made beloved to the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa They do use their senses um, often in a more profound and intuitive way, whereas men tend to just crash into things at face value and they become... You know, scientists who look at x-ray galaxies or whatever and that's one of the things they can do but the, there's a certain blind a capacity for blindness uh, which is dangerous and those who think about 
sexism in religion should ponder the fact that Iblis is unmistakably male. Mm. <laughs> Let's not get too um, proud of ourselves. Okay, there's Adam, uh, there's also Iblis, so um, things are not necessarily all our own way. So, uh, finally, Rumi, at the end of this great uh, ghazal, is saying you should listen with both ears and without a tongue speak with him. In other words, with the zabani hal, not the zabani qal, zabani hal, the real communing, munajat, with Allah is what the heart is, is saying to him and with him. For the tongue's words are never without disagreement or harm. Because uh, words, sukhan, what is outward speech, and Sheikh Ghalib in his Husna Ashq talks about this, uh, their capacity to encompass inward realities, deeper things, is, is problematic. Problematic. And the wise ulama, when they speak of some of the raid matters that are there, necessary to be believed in our aqidah, like what really is the state of the people of the graves? What really is going on when you see the Holy Prophet وسلم, in a dream? All of these funny things. They say that the scholars can use words to describe these in different ways, uh, but we need to be aware of the limitation of words. And one problem that we have if we see only with one eye is that we tend to assume that words are bayan, that's what we have, and they can encompass everything. A lot of Muslims get into big arguments over things like the visiting of graves and other Barton things. And the arguments will not help because the arguments have to use words and these things are kind of poetic, musical, ghaibi and can't be encompassed by that. So the wise ulama will say that you leave those things open and you respect people who take a, a range of views on those subjects. So he says, fall silent. And often in his ghazals he does say at the end, um, be silent. The tongue's words are never without disagreement or harm. And let's remember that the graveyard here is the graveyard of the Khamushan, the graveyard of the silent ones, silent in this higher sense that they were in a world of meaning, a world of true perception, a world in which the heart was truly in Munajat with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a mirror like heart reflecting the the, the, the light of the divine glory, uh, a state which is <coughs> beyond qilqal, beyond chit chat, beyond words. So they were silent in the true sense. Khamush bashtu azrenji goft, kegoye machos, kedar penahi chunan yari mihriban rafti. Fall silent, avoid the pain of speech, because you are now in the hospitable presence of. Um, the generous friend and that is where they are radiallahu anhum wa ardahum may Allah bless you and bless us all we've got to the end of this uh, this great ghazal inshallah and remember that the divan shamsi tabriz when it's properly printed is so big that you can't even lift it he produced so much of this this is just um, a few lines uh, from that extraordinary ocean uh, so May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestow his blessings upon Mawlana Rumi and grant us some of his fuyudat and some of his barakat and increase us in istiqama in this deen. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Ashq olsun. Murgh baagh malakutam مرغ باغ ملکوتم نیم از عالم خاک دو سه روزی قفسی دو سه روزی قفسی ساخت Ba-da-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-